This is Seymour Rocks, reporting from Down Under. It has been an absolute pleasure having Dane Weddington of Geoengineering Watch reach out and having the opportunity of asking him some of the questions they really wanted to ask and have him respond with great generosity and honesty. I have said this before but I've have had to reassess at least 30 years of assumptions when it comes to anthropogenic global warming. For a long time I had hoped that something would happen to solve this and take us out of this crisis. But this hope was dashed some years ago uh, watching the Danish cops go after the environmental activists with great violence at COP15 in Copenhagen. And since then we've been watching the, um, the world burn while the, the whole while the whole world fiddles. The one great achievement of Guy McPherson amongst others was to show that this was not a problem that could simply be solved. It is something rather that is tied to the nature of human industrial society itself. Basically warming is a symptom of a predicament that is endemic to civilization itself. Uh, as Guy goes says, civilization itself is a heat engine. In the past year I've developed a few skills in monitoring things myself and I've learnt not to rely on others to tell me what to think. The whole process has been very revealing and I have lost more than one friendship because of my independence. I've come to realise that there's so much more going on and that the fate of our human species is tied to other anthropogenic causes. Perhaps the most significant one is what we may call geoengineering or any of the other names it goes by. The Dane has revealed real evidence that needs to be seriously examined. It's not in the realm of conspiracy theory, but there's evidence that needs to be responded to, such as the high levels of toxic heavy metals that uh, does not seem to have any easy explanation, the numerous patents that have been taken out, the presence of nanoparticulates released by planes, and indeed uh, the footage of planes um, turning on and off their nozzles to produce what are commonly called uh, uh, chemtrails. Not least, there is evidence coming from the Arctic, which we have discussed in some detail. I hope you'll open your minds and examine some of the evidence that Dane Widgington produces. I'm not trying to simply sing to the choir. So here it is. Um, watch my conversation or listen to my conversation with Dane Widgington. More rocks reporting from down under, and it's my huge pleasure to have Dane Wickington from geoengineeringwatch.org. Uh, uh, hello, Dane. Hello, Robin. Very glad to join you. Yeah, well, it's my mutual pleasure. Uh, uh, so perhaps uh, we've got limited time, so perhaps you'd just like to briefly introduce yourself. I, I, I'm sure you, for most people listening to this, uh, they won't need any introduction. But, uh, well, I, I am the administrator for geoengineeringwatch.org. We're the largest website on the subject of geoengineering in the world. We're non-political. We don't advertise on the site. Our point and purpose, our mission, is to bring to light data that certainly makes clear that climate engineering programs are not just a proposal but a reality. I have a background in the solar industry. I work for the world's largest engineering firm, uh, some time ago, Bechtel Power, my home is fully off grid, been off grid for nearly 20 years. And that's what brought me to this issue, Robin. Yeah. The fact that I, I built a large off grid home 
in Northern California. And when I began to lose extraordinarily high amounts of my solar PV photovoltaic uptake from whatever these aircraft were leaving behind, that's what started my research and that's what uh, brought this issue to my attention. Yeah, great. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I've, I've always sort of picked up that point that you'd lost uh, solar power. I mean, that was really what started you off, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, I'm going to start off with a, uh, a rather large uh, introduction and uh, giving my own kind of very briefly my own journey and then and then we'll uh, we'll go from there. So, Dane, you'll, you'll no doubt be aware of where I've come from. I've been a, a fan of the ideas of Guy McPherson and others in what we might call the uh, near-term human extinction movement. Uh, so I can tell you, uh, I've been dragged shouting and screaming into acknowledging that geoengineering is truly going on, not as just some harebrained project in the future, uh, but as a reality. Um, yeah, so go back a year or so, I used to get, well, actually a bit more than that, I used to get annoyed when every time I talked to anyone about climate change, people would come back and they would quote you and then uh, they would say, uh, oh, geoengineering, but it was, it, it always seemed like a way of deflecting uh, from the reality of climate change. So, uh, since then, of course, I've come to realize that you are not deflecting at all, and that some people may have uh, perhaps misunderstood you. So, talking for myself, it was observing the changed skies over New Zealand uh, that helped me uh, change my mind. So, until recently, our skies in New Zealand were so pristine, so pure, that when I came back from overseas, they seemed positively harsh. Uh, but no longer, I've never in my 60 plus years now come across such oddities. Um, and I've, yeah, I've, I mean, completely odd skies. Uh, so it was about that time that I, uh, I learned to use NASA Worldview and other uh, data sets and saw a similar thing from above. And I was lucky to have someone, my friend Margot, uh, explain to me what it was. And so I started joining dots. And then there was this. Um, I came across a photograph uh, from a paper of... Uh, a photograph of views of trails over Cyprus. Uh, I think they were from 2016 from memory. And then when I checked, I just did a bit of fact checking to see, ah, oh, is this real? And then I, to my horror, uh, I found that NASA had done a cut and paste and they'd cut out all the evidence. No more, uh, no more uh, trails. Um, so what draw me, drew me to your work is that you were showing more than one dimension to this. It wasn't a, a unidimensional explanation of things. And from what I've observed in the last year, I can fully accept the thesis that stratospheric aerosol injection of particulates is being used to try and suppress and hide the true extent of rapid heating on the planet. So I'd like to discuss with you, Dane, the situation in the Arctic and the role that geoengineering can be playing in all of that. But first of all, I'd just like to address some more general questions I have. So uh, my first sort of question goes along these lines. Again, that's a slightly long question. Uh, so there's no doubt that geoengineering is the elephant in the room. Sometimes it seems that you acknowledge anthropogenic climate change, but you also say that geoengineering has been going on for 70 years. Um, so we humans have been putting greenhouse gases and particulates into the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution, at least. And now, positive, thanks to positive feedbacks, um, we have nature releasing huge amounts of uh, CO2 and other well, um, particulates due to wildfires, volcanoes and the like. So I'm just wondering uh, how you can say that geoengineering is the number one uh, contributor uh, to climate change. That's the sort of one thing that kind of, uh, you know, 
well, it doesn't rankle, but it, it, yeah, you know, w w when I hear it, because I, I, I'm not sort of totally convinced of that, that it's number one. If I can answer, I'll answer that question first, then I want to fall back if I can. What I have always stated about climate engineering, Robin, to frame this accurately, is not that it is the, it is the single greatest contributor in yeah. that that is not that is not to say that it outweighs all other anthropogenic factors. So that's a very delicate statement to make if you understand. So if we have X amount of pieces to this puzzle, I would argue geoengineering is mathematically the single greatest piece, but that does not mean that it is bigger than all the other pieces combined. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, no, that makes total sense. So, yeah. so this is, again, when we look at climate engineering, the fact that it is completely, and the downstream effects from climate engineering are so extraordinary and complex that we must calculate all that into the equation, starting with the destruction of the ozone layer, directly related to climate engineering, trapping more heat than it deflects, related to climate engineering, disruption of the hydrological cycle, directly related to climate engineering, which now translates into a single greatest causal factor with the massive forest burn downs we see occurring all over the globe, which I would argue is actually a component being used by the climate engineers to further load the atmosphere with particulates in a desperate attempt to try to cool polar regions. We've done reports on this specifically. And if I could back up to what you correctly stated, that many, many misquote me as stating that climate engineering is the cause of global warming. I have never stated that as a singular cause by any means. I lectured on anthropogenic global warming prior to focusing everything on climate engineering because this massive missing component is inexcusable to leave out of the equation. So I am extremely familiar with, with anthropogenic global warming and its factors. I've, I've studied this for two decades and and certainly there's no arguing the fact that humanity has decimated the planet. We put 100 million tons of CO2 in the atmosphere a day. We've cut down the forest. We've paved the planet. We've poisoned the oceans. And I am in no way negating that. What I'm stating is that we can't have a legitimate discussion about the climate or the state of the climate without addressing this, as you correctly stated, elephant in the room. So again, to clarify our position at geoengineeringwatch.org, we are not saying that climate engineering outweighs all other factors combined. Not saying that. Only saying if we have X amount of pieces in the puzzle, geoengineering would be the single biggest piece regarding climate disruption because yeah. of the scope and scale of these programs, but not, not outweighing all the other pieces combined. Not at all. Just the single biggest slice in the pie. That's all. Yeah, yeah no, I got, I got that clear. In fact, that's, actually, that's the clearest explanation of that that I've heard so far. So... Uh, uh, and then my next question, I think uh, it might be just coming at it from a slightly different angle. I think you might have already addressed this, but uh, what is your assessment of the relative importance of the greenhouse effect giving rise to global warming and climate collapse? It's extraordinary. And, and this is, it's, it's very, always been perplexing to me how so many can excuse this away, that obviously our planet a spinning ball of rock in a very harsh and cold environment of space has is, is existed and supported life because of greenhouse gases that have regulated the heat, have provided an energy balance for the planet. And when you thicken those layers, how can the planet not heat more? Of course yeah. it will heat more. And it's extraordinary to me that this is excused away for so many that um, via ideology or or other forms of bias are not able to acknowledge this. And especially when we start to discuss gases like methane or nitrous oxide, methane, and this is where we see the deception from the IPCC. And what we see, and as you correctly stated also, the falsification of data from NASA on the methane levels, and we've just seen recent falsification again, it appears they have radically lowered the official methane readings from what we know them to be from earlier counts. So they are falsifying data to the downside. They're falsifying temperatures to yeah. the downside. And that's what we see at Geoengineering Watch from all our monitoring that we do. So what does that mean? It means that the planet is already far warmer than even what we're being told. And this is where climate engineering, to answer your question about the polar regions, 
has been used to mask the true severity of polar meltdown in that we see, as I know I've seen you correctly address, address in the past, that the official sources like the IPCC and other ice monitoring data sources are counting sea slush as ice yes, pack. Yes. And they are, not, they are not considering or even making mention of the volume, the mass of the ice, which has plummeted precipitously. So now they're counting any region of, of ocean that is 15% slush or more is counted as ice pack. That's yeah. still 85% ocean. So from every imaginable direction, what we see is a masking, a hiding, a falsification of data to mask the true severity and immediacy of climate collapse and sea surface ice nucleation appears to be a major component with climate engineering. We have NASA satellite imagery to show huge areas of what absolutely appear to be sea surface nucleation. It's not a natural nucleation formation on the sea surface at temperatures that should not support any ice nucleation at all. We see this when we see certain storms, Robin, on the East Coast last year where they showed Boston Harbor full of slush, ice slush on the surface with sea temperatures that were uh, they were pushing 40 degrees in some cases. We know, we know ocean uh, water, seawater does not support ice formation until 28.4 degrees Fahrenheit. So yeah, yeah, why, that's right. So why is there slush on the surface of the sea at that, at that temperature? Why do we see the ice balls on Lake Michigan, which I would challenge any of your, your followers to look up? Uh, we, we have images of these perfectly spherical massive 60, 70 pound ice boulders blanketing beaches in Lake Michigan with, sea, with, with lake temperatures that were 40 plus degrees. How can that happen without chemical ice nucleation? So that's a major component of climate engineering that's not being considered, and I'll leave it with this, Robin. And you can see how when they're chemically nucleating storms as they just did in Montana, yes. and we, have, we have 90 degrees in Minnesota, this just occurred uh, yesterday and the day before, 90 degrees in Minnesota, while we have record cold and record snow in Montana. This yeah. is absolutely ridiculous. So people need to look up the engineering winter section on Geoengineering Watch. They can find patents for everything I'm discussing. And this is a major part of climate engineering that's used to mask the true severity of global meltdown. Yes, yes. Yeah, well, I, I actually, uh, slightly... Uh, I was just wondering, uh, God, her name is, oh, yeah, I'm just wondering, because you don't really make, I haven't seen much reference to, to, to her in your material, but I'm just wondering kind of what you think of the work of, of Jennifer Francis, because that's, that's always what I've gone by. I've always listened to Paul Beckwith, and he's explained, you know, how the, you know, you know, the, the chip jet stream is, is, is uh, becoming wavier and it's broken up. It's totally, um, yeah, totally broken up because, you know, because of the, uh, you know, the heat forcing at the equator and you've lost that differential between, you know, between the two. I'm just wondering kind of if you could comment sort of briefly on that. I'm not familiar with Jennifer's work. I am familiar and acquainted with Mr. Beckwith. Yes. I, I think you're, I, I believe you posted two live on-air equal time debates I did with Mr. Beckwith. If people yeah. search geoengineeringwatch.org uh, debates, Paul Beckwith, they should find those debates. And I think that would be revealing. With regards to Do Mr. Beckwith's commentary on the jet stream behavior, certainly it is behaving very anomalously. But when we're leaving massive parts of the equation out, that's where the conversation yeah. And the conclusions become illegitimate. So yeah. in regard to jet stream behavior, when we know we have ionosphere heaters around the globe, installations like HARP in Alaska, that scientific data does not dispute can and do heat the ionosphere to extraordinary temperatures by causing an electrical chain reaction in the ionosphere, we know that they can affect upper level wind currents by this bulge that's created by the ionosphere heaters in the atmosphere. So how can we possibly leave that out of the equation when we're talking about jet stream behavior? In addition, when we know atmospheric particulate saturation, i.e. solar radiation management, stratospheric aerosol injection, when we know that blanket of reflective particulates greatly affects convection and thus affecting wind, 
How yeah. can we possibly leave that out of the equation? So in the debates and discussions I had with Mr. Beckwith, uh, it seemed very clear that he would not, was not willing to examine any of the data in this subject category at all. Yes. And again, I would simply state this, and, and it is our position at geoengineeringwatch.org, we fully acknowledge that our species has decimated the planet. Anthropogenic global warming is absolutely real. It's far worse than we've been told. And climate engineering is a massive part of the equation. And we can't have a legitimate discussion about the climate without including that. That's our position. Yeah. Well, actually, that brings me on to something else that um, um, uh, I heard you say the other day on one of your uh, what, Sunday, our times, your, your Saturday broadcasts. Uh, and that sort of raised the hair <laughs> on my head slightly. And that was when you said that, uh, I think, if I'm right, that global temperatures have reached over three degrees. Uh, and this is being uh, suppressed by geoengineering. And if I can say that, uh, by saying that, you, you seem to have out Guy McPherson. <laughs> Sorry, out, out Guy Guy McPherson. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, the likes of Sam Kurana are saying, well, the temperature is about somewhere between 1.7 and and uh, set to go over two. So I'm just wondering uh, what process you follow to get this figure, if I'm right about this, uh, and what might lead to this figure becoming apparent? Because I mean, obviously uh, such, such heating is, is um, you know, is being suppressed mightily. There are several factors that would go into our conclusion that we are likely past three degrees C now, today. First, every site we monitor, not just in the US, but in a number of other countries, Northern and Southern Hemisphere, what we see is a systematic under-reporting of official high temperatures. We see this across the board and it's to an extraordinary scale. We, we commonly see five degrees Fahrenheit or more under-reporting of the high temperatures. When we match that with temperatures temperature readings from the ground from other sources. So we start with that. Again, a massive underreporting of the official high temperatures. Next, when you have events like we're having right now in the United States, it's a prime example. We have half the country at below normal temperatures. In fact, record cold in some areas, as I just mentioned, with the, the chemically nucleated cool down, the snow that creates a, a shallow, dense layer of cool air in the surface. When they engineer a cool down zone, they will take hundreds of low temperature readings from the same size geographic area as if you're in a record warm zone as we have in the southeastern US right now, they will take maybe a tenth of those readings. So they will tilt the scale toward sensationalizing any cold zone and maximizing the temperature readings taken in anywhere that they've created this cold zone while minimizing and downplaying the temperatures taken in record warm areas. So again, we see a data falsification across the, across the, the whole board that is trying desperately to mask, just like they have done with the polar ice, to try to mask the true severity of what's unfolding. And this is where, again, you know, the IPCC, you know that they don't consider feedback loops. They don't actually yeah, yeah. consider methane, UV. And, and Robin, I'll, I'll give you a bit of new news this morning, and I, I'll, I'll go over this more in my weekly broadcast, but we just received back from our, our attorneys responses from NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, our inquiry into their data on the amount of UV radiation that's actually hitting the planet. And we have document after document after document completely redacted, everything on it redacted. Oh, wow. Hiding something very big. We'll publish these documents uh, as soon as we can, but I mean, it's a glaring red flag. On yeah. the so another huge component of planetary heating, obviously the radiant heat from UV is immense. And we are getting UVC in the surface. Tianjin Watch was the first that I know of to publish that about five plus years ago. So, so many factors are being hidden and that's all plugs into the equation of the conclusion that we are likely past three degrees C right yeah. now. 
Well, I can confirm one thing, uh, you know, that falsification, I've seen it here in this country, like July, we had an amazingly warm July, and it absolutely had to be the warmest on record, but the uh, Niwa, that's our version of NOAA, were about to come out with a report uh, saying it was the sort of second or third warmest, and you know, kind of implying that it was nothing uh, particularly sort of different about it. But then uh, one of our great uh, 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 climate scientists uh, came out with a report before the NIWA report, and he, he, he went through all the weather stations, not the selected ones that they used. And of course, uh, he came up with a, a, um, a different result that July was by far and above that you know they you know the the, the warmest uh, month we've ever had in this country, but they were getting ready to uh, to report that it wasn't that way. Exactly my point. Yeah, and then I had something. I oh, just as a as as an aside. Uh, I don't know whether you've seen the news of uh, uh, the the iceberg that has broken off the largest iceberg that's broken off uh, Antarctica. And um, yeah, it was underreported here. And then I, I just saw, I didn't open it up, but I, I, I saw something from the Indian Express and it was uh, talking about this. And it said, uh, oh, this iceberg is carved off, but it's nothing to do with global warming. Yes, I did see the reports. Guardian UK covered that as well. And, and they made, they went out of their way to make that assertion that it has nothing to do with global warming, which is patently absurd. We, we know the ocean temperatures are off the scale. Again, we see an underreporting in that arena as well. And this type of uh, public deception is becoming far worse, not better. Interesting that we just got news also that Scripps Institute has just retracted a report they did last year that the oceans were warming far faster than we are being told. And there was no reason for that report to be retracted other than somebody is leaning on somebody. And that's exactly what we see right now. So um, we just see academia in so many arenas uh, running scared from those in power who are connected to their funding and so forth. And uh, I hope that equation changes. I hope the people in academia realize that on the yeah. current course, none of us will be here much longer. Their paychecks and pensions aren't going to matter much longer. And I hope they stand their ground and start telling the whole truth, Robin. Yeah, well, I mean, the problem is that we don't have scientists in white coats in their laboratories doing their own independent, you know, research. It's all corporatized and everyone is, is um, you know, is being told what they can say and what they can't say. I've seen major examples of that in this, you know, in this country. So, you know, if people don't want to kind of end up on the scrap heap and be sacked and kind of, you know, uh, you know, I mean, they, they have to toe the line. Well, they've convinced themselves that they have to. They've convinced yeah. themselves that somehow that will preserve their personal paradigm. But I would argue hiding in your cabin on the Titanic will not save you. Yeah. And we well, look at statistically for the, for the articles or for the, the calving of the iceberg in, in Antarctica that we've just seen, to, to not connect that with the changes we see on our planet is statistically... It's criminal. It's absurd. So when we yeah. look at statistically, science study conservatively has calculated that the current changes, earth changes happening on our planet are happening at minimum 170 times faster than any yeah. previous paleo event. How can we possibly consider anything to be normal or natural at this point? And the statistical odds of these changes not being caused by human activity is a statistical zero. That's been done by statisticians. So again, um, at this point, to, for them to make that type of assertion is simply to show that those in power are putting immense pressure on media, on academia, to simply lie about how severe the situation is to avoid panicking populations until the last possible moment. Well, actually, what we've got is, is um, you know, human-made causes upon human-made causes. Yes. And I would argue, again, when it, on the climate engineering issue, which was fully deployed, data indicates, immediately after World War II, primarily over the polar regions, I would argue that that decision made by governments around the globe 
to commit the human race and indeed the entire web of life to an experiment from which there is no return without our knowledge or consent is at least short of nuclear cataclysm, the single most devastating destructive human activity of all in that they have completely derailed Earth's life support okay. systems and responses. So in regard to the boreal forest, for example, the fact that climate engineering has so completely derailed the processes by which boreal forests are sustained in Northern California, for example, this high pressure dome and back to the steering of the jet stream, which we had Mr. Beck with mention without mentioning ionosphere heaters and their effect on the jet stream. We've had, Robin, you've heard of the ridiculously resilient ridge over the yeah, years. Yeah, it was just, it was just on the tip of my mind to mention it. <laughs> it's back, so, isn't it? It's back. And when did we first see this pattern established? When the Arctic ice first began to crash at a scale never before seen was 2007. Yes. And it appeared that on that current trajectory, we would have a blue ocean event by perhaps 2009 or 10. But then we saw the ridiculous resilient ridge established uh, late 2007, 2008. And that diverts the moisture up and around the U.S. West. It's pushed back down toward the Gulf, picks up moisture along the East Coast, pumps it up towards Greenland. All that moisture is chemically nucleated. It, it, it was a conveyor system, if you will, that it appears the geoengineers established that although it sacrificed the West and the forest in the West incinerated, yeah. and if you remember in 2008, and I fought those forest fires on the front line in a D6 caterpillar, I mean, I, I was, I had to deal with the repercussions of what the geoengineers did firsthand, but that's when we saw that pattern first established, and if you remember the surface area, the ice extent recovery going into 2008-2009, was extraordinarily greater than what the polar scientists thought could happen. They were all surprised that at this ice rebound, if you will, in 2012, when the ice began to crash again. If you remember the, the, the ice decline in 2012, you remember that? Yeah. We were losing yeah, yeah, oh yes. Uh, I really came on the scene sort of about that time. So that's, my memory doesn't go back in the sense to 2008, but I remember 2012 very well. We were losing at the end of the melt season 100,000 square kilometers of ice a day. The pattern was reestablished. The surface area statistical recovery occurred again. And the same pattern we saw, the ridiculous resilient ridge over the West connected to what they were doing in the Arctic. So even what's happening here in the U.S. West, it appears, is directly connected to what's occurring in the Arctic and the statistical graphing shows this. As our heat goes up, rain goes down, Arctic ice extent expands, and we typically see this happening at the end of the melt season when it gets the worst, yeah. which, which is right now, and we're seeing the same thing. The, the NOAA long-term uh, weather, quote, forecast, which we would argue is the scheduled weather, shows a circular bullseye for the next three months of above normal temperatures and below normal precipitation because of the ridiculous resilient ridge parked right over us, same pattern, year after year directly connected to climate engineering. Well, that makes perfect sense to me, Dane, because um, it accords with what I've seen for myself with, with my own eyes and, you know, looking at the ground zero of climate change, you know, the, the Arctic. And the, I've just seen, I mean, how every, you know, like this year, last year and every other year, you know, we've had unprecedented melting and then suddenly it recovers in August and, and, and we're saved for another year. Anyway, yes. um, I'll move on slightly. Um, so the one thing that uh, had the most influence on my thinking was the BBC documentary on global dimming that came out, I don't know, in the mid-2000s from memory, and it's sort of been all but disappeared. So it was through that that I first learned about methane clathrates. And, of course, for the past... Most majority of the past seven years, I've su subscribed to Guy McPherson's thesis that economic collapse would lead to particulates falling out of the sky and then a rapid heating over a short period of time. It seems to me that he, <laughs> without knowing it, uh, is talking about the ending of pollution from all sources, traditional smokestack pollution, as well as even if he chooses to regard it, disregard it from geoengineering. So my question is, um, do you have any reasons to suggest that we may not have a, a rapid increase in 
temperatures uh, uh, from an end to global dimming. It, it seems to be a natural uh, progression from what you were saying about the three degrees global temperatures. So I'd just be interested in how you understand this. Is geoengineering not a part, or a part, major, albeit a major part of this scenario? Is the problem not with the theory, but with the fact that geoengineering uh, is overlooked? It's a complex answer to the question. And if I can back up to the BBC documentary, um, Dimming the Sun. Yes. And, and that's, yes, they are trying to express that documentary. Now, if we look at the conclusions of that documentary, which I would argue the, the producers knew about climate engineering, and they showed a number of footage clips that I would indicate were uh, alluding to this, but they could not talk about it directly and still get that film published. But as they made clear, the evaporation rates had greatly diminished due to this solar dimming. We know that blocking direct sunlight has an immense effect on evaporation. The loss of direct sunlight alone reduces evaporation. The particulates reduce convection, which reduces wind, which also reduces evaporation. So what are we losing? We're losing Earth's natural cloud producing mechanisms from the particulates. And that is not discussed, not mentioned, not accounted for in those that are covertly pushing climate engineering as being beneficial by stating the particulates are the only thing saving us from immediate incineration. They are not calculating in the hydrological cycle reduction from these particulates. So they're re reducing Earth's natural cloud cover. Another factor that those covertly selling climate engineering by pushing atmospheric particulates as being the only thing saving us at this moment, they refer to, Robin, the days after 9-11, when we saw yeah. daytime temperatures go up two degrees, nighttime temperatures went down. Yeah. That tiny window of time, while blanket geoengineering, solar radiation management spraying was still going on over the oceans and everywhere else in the world, that tiny window of time is not remotely enough to come to any conclusion because the hydrological cycle could not begin to restart from that tiny snapshot yeah, right. that tiny geographic area. So what we've done with climate engineering is we're destroying Earth's natural cloud making mechanisms. And if I could summarize that briefly and I'll give this back to you. So we know climate engineering and science study bears this out is destroying the ozone layer. All the studies, of course, because they don't admit to climate engineering, saying it will destroy the ozone layer if we do it, but it has been done for 70 years. We know the ozone layer is disintegrating. We have a former NASA contract engineer that has worked for us proving this with metering equipment we supplied him. That destroyed ozone layer is killing plankton. Plankton feed in the upper layers of the water column because they photosynthesize. The UV is slaughtering plankton on top of every other human activity that's harming plankton. But plankton being a massive cloud production mechanism on the planet. Boreal forest being a secondary cloud production mechanism, also being decimated from climate engineering because of the intense UV, because of the toxic particles, which we are not speculating, hypothesizing, or theorizing about. We know it's in the precipitation because we take precipitation tests from all over the globe. Those toxic metals, starting with aluminum, are poisoning root systems in boreal forests. We have yeah. peer-reviewed study to prove that when those organisms detect this contamination, they shut down nutrient uptake, start to die a slow protracted death. Then the beetles take over and everything's blamed on the beetles. The beetles are a symptom. They're not a core causal factor. So we're losing the boreal forest. And the, and the forest, Robin, I can tell you firsthand, living in the middle of a massive wilderness area in, in Northern California, forests don't smell like forest anymore because of yeah. the low humidity, because of the UV, because of the lack of the hydrological cycle, they've shut their stomata, their respiratory ports. So they're in, the forests are not breathing. They're not uptaking carbon. They're not releasing oxygen. They're not contributing to the cloud making cycle. Uh, again, from, and I'm only touching the surface and I won't go any further because I know we have limited time, but yeah. from every conceivable direction, <coughs> climate engineering is derailing the planet's natural life support and response systems and toxifying everything in the web of life. Well, even down here in New Zealand, I can see that. I mean, we, you know, we get we get a rainstorm, and then uh, you know, then you go out after a few days, and the soil is dry. You know, everything is drying out. Well, these are desiccant particulates. Yes, they absorb yes. Create atmospheric moisture, and we just got peer-reviewed study. We just covered this on our broadcast that now proves for the last two decades, because 
the humidities on average have dropped so low that the growth rate globally of flora has declined 59%. And, and we can only attribute this to the factor that's not mentioned, the climate engineering elephant in the room, because yeah. short of that factor, the laws of physics tell us that for every degree C of warming, the atmosphere carries 7% more moisture. Thus, you must have more rain overall on a warming planet. And when you don't have more rain and more overall humidity on a warming planet, something is in the equation that is not being acknowledged. That something is climate engineering. Well, I think they sort of say that some areas will be uh, have less rain and then others will have hugely more. You know. But overall, overall, yes. there must be more overall. And yes. there is not more overall now. Yes, we have drought and deluge, but again, 7% more moisture for every degree C of warming. We are likely past three, three degrees C right now. Yeah, yeah. We, overall, we should have much more precipitation. And in fact, the IPCC models, and I have some of their original manuals. I have their original manual from 1995. Uh, these are expensive and extensive manuals. And their predictions, minus the climate engineering factor, were for the greatest increase in precipitation in the whole lower 48 of the U.S. to be right bullseye in the area where I live. That's why I moved here, because of my yeah. research. And that has not happened. Why hasn't that happened? Because of the climate engineering factor, which they will not acknowledge. So instead of, instead of the greatest increase in precipitation here in Northern California and Southern Oregon, we see a, a weather whiplash scenario that involves overall a decrease in precipitation. How can yeah. that happen? Because the, the and we have NASA photograph or NASA images, satellite images of the Eastern Pacific of massive grid pattern blanket aerosol spraying, part of solar radiation management going on every day, disrupts the storm track, disrupts the hydrological cycle, thwarts the evaporative cycle. This this elephant in the room again, Robin, is immense, and the fact that academia is denying it is absolutely criminal. Yeah. At this point. yeah so you, you've explained that really well. Uh, one thing. Um, because I'm not that sort of, sci of you know, scientific bent, but uh, I'm just wondering if you can explain to people uh, what the hydrological cycle actually is. I, I don't know whether it lends itself to a, sh a short answer. but <laughs> It's the process by which the planet distributes moisture throughout all its regions. Without the hydrological cycle, we would have no, no terrestrial life. There would be no water to, to create that life. So the, the mechanisms that create this cycle are many and complex, again, from plankton to boreal forests and other factors. And when, we, when you disrupt this cycle from the top down, again, thwarting evaporation over the oceans, which is the greatest producer of the hydrological cycle. And when you have the kind of blanket spraying we see over the oceans that, again, blocks direct sunlight, reduces convection, that reduces wind, and, and on that subject, Robin, of wind, by the way, we don't just have a condition of global dimming. We have another condition that has been recognized by global biologists called global stilling. Right. And this, this is an acknowledgement of the reduced wind. And, and they, they discovered this by uh, determining that predators were having more difficulty finding prey because the wind was not moving foliage around enough. And that's a very obscure way to discover this, but we, we definitely have a global stilling situation. And myself being on wind power as well, I have three wind turbines. I can tell you absolutely with total certainty, we have a extraordinarily reduced wind patterns here. It's, it's yeah. from 10 years ago. It's profound. So all these factors, again, affecting the hydrological cycle, i.e. the rain cycle by which life on our planet has existed in the way it's existed, and there is no greater, this is back to our original discussion, there is no greater factor affecting that than climate engineering. And that is not to, to negate all other forms of human pollution, particulate pollution, and so forth. But when we add everything that climate engineering affects into the equation, not just the stated goal of the climate engineers to put 20 million tons of aluminum nanoparticulates into the atmosphere annually. And that was stated by the world's most recognized geoengineer, David Keith, in direct response to my question to him, which I think you perhaps have seen, Robin, have you seen me yeah. confront Dr. Keith? So um, that is their stated goal. But in addition to that, when we calculate in the amount of particulate matter that's entering the atmosphere from the massive forest burn downs all over the globe from the Amazon, Siberia, British Columbia, Canada, Alaska, Southern Hemisphere, 
Malaysia. When we add that particulate matter into the equation, that's directly related to the effects of climate engineering. The, the total devastation from climate engineering becomes truly incomprehensible. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I think uh, we might have already sort of addressed this, uh, but I'll, I'll sort of go back to it because it's uh, very, very important, well, to everybody on the planet. Uh, and that's the whole thing about uh, ultraviolet um, uh, levels. And because it's so, well, it's, not t it's certainly not uh, counterintuitive, but it, it goes right against the, you know, the conventional view. And I, I, I've, you've probably seen, I've written quite a lot about this on, on, on my blog. Uh, and it's the idea that UV levels are in fact going up when they're pretending that they're going down. So I'm just wondering whether you have anything else to uh, sort of add to that. But I mean, there's a whole thing about um, that I found, well, uh, really alarming is, is when I read uh, about the aluminum residues being found in aquatic species and the death and you know the involvement in the decimation of insect populations so in each of these cases there are other explanations so like neonicotinoids in the cases of, of of bees or vaccination in the case of autism and children um, so i can see that aluminium and nanoparticulates could play a major part in this but i'm just wondering again I'm, I'm, I, uh, are coming back to the same question, really, how you would see the relative importance of this compared with all of these other explanations that are thrown up. And as you know, I try to follow either or explanations. I think it's certainly important to look at all sources of data in regard to the UV issue. To my knowledge, Geoengineering Watch was the first larger source site to publish conclusions based on our readings and our study that extraordinarily high levels of UV radiation were bombarding the planet, including UVC. When we first published that data in 2014, our website was, was down within 15 minutes, was taken down, was, was taken offline eight times in the next three days. We had to get additional security uh, for our website to keep the site up. What we published is this with our metering that UVB, we are told Robin by official sources like NOAA and NASA, that 95% of all incoming UV is UVA, 5% is UVB, no UVC. We're told UVC stops 100,000 feet up in the atmosphere. What our readings determined was that UVB was extraordinarily higher than we were being told, five, 600% higher than we were being told. And we were detecting UVC in the surface as well. Since that time, this a NASA contract engineer that worked directly for us with very expensive metering equipment we supplied him, has determined extraordinary levels of UVC on the surface and his readings from July of 2018 for UVC levels as compared to his readings of July of 2019 for UVC levels saw an additional 43% increase in UVC from 2018 to 2019. So it's going up at unimaginable speed. His calculations that on the current rate of ozone collapse are that if the current rate of damage continues, we likely face total ozone layer collapse by 2026. What would that mean for all of us? It would mean game over. In regard to the unacknowledged factors in the equation, let's look at insect decline. Geoengineeringwatch.org nearly 10 years ago published that we saw an 80 to 90% decline in aquatic and terrestrial insects in the US West based on our data from former government scientists. Academia rolled their eyes and walked away at that data as if it were completely incorrect. What do we see now? A complete acknowledgement of the data we posted. Insect apocalypse, we see that type of headline everywhere, that acknowledgement, 80% plus insect decline. So why did it take them? My question is this, why did it take official sources 10 years to catch up to us on that data? In regard to the bees and the die-off, what else is missing from that equation? Are the neonicotinoids a problem? Yes. Is you, or, uh, RF, radio frequency, microwave transmissions, are they a problem? Yes. But what's the bigger problem that's not being acknowledged? Yet again, aluminum. We knew that bees were dying a thousand miles away from any farm source or any radio frequency microwave source. There had to be a bigger issue. We knew what it was. Our lab tests proved the aluminum was in the air column. And what do we have now? And I challenge anyone to search B 
bees slash aluminum. You may have to search it somewhere besides Google because Google is systematically deleting yeah. anything, everything that's damning, including our website, by the way. Yeah. We're, we were the biggest site in the world on the subject. We were the top of the first page for a search of the geoengineering term. Six months ago, Google completely deleted us from 20 pages of data on the subject. So if, you're, if your followers search bees slash aluminum, they will find peer-reviewed study that the bees are dying of symptoms that resemble Alzheimer's and dementia in a human being. Why? Because they're packed full of aluminum. Why isn't that headlines everywhere? Yeah, quite.